Uh, okay, hi, uh, I'm Daniel Thornburg. Uh, I'm the main co-gen author behind the LVM Most project, um, and that's a project to make a 6502 backend for LVM. So, uh, brief bit of introduction, if you haven't happened to heard of the 6502, uh, it's an 8-bit CPU, uh, and it was in all of these devices, a bunch more that wouldn't fit on the slide. Uh, these devices were wildly popular from the late 70s through the early 90s when the chip was in heavy use. Uh, amazingly, several million of these are still sold today. It's like one of the fewest transistor accounts that you can get on like a real practical CPU. Uh, and there's still huge retro and uh, retro computing and retro gaming communities around these. So uh, it's not uncommon for people today to still find themselves knee deep in 6502 assembly. Uh, that being said, you know, the first question I get asked about this is why on earth make a LVM backend for, you know, a 40 year old chip? Um, Personally, I was interested in writing software for one of these old systems. Uh, and when I looked at the current crop of C compilers, you know, despite its age, um, it, a kind of consensus has formed that it's just not possible to machine generate good code for this chip. Uh, and that's relative to the uh, remarkable ease with which a human has writing uh, good machine code for the 6502. It's considered one of the easiest uh, assembly languages for a novice to write good code in. Uh, and good here is maybe 10 to 20 times more performant than the current like reference C compiler for this. So I didn't think this was an intrinsic state of affairs. I didn't really buy that there was like absolutely no way to like create a performant uh, code generator for this. So I wanted to take LVM, you know, all of the principles and practices that have gone into its crop of code generation techniques uh, and apply them to this problem to see if it would work well. Uh, and if it would work well for the 6502, there's other weird, tiny microarchitectures that are all, you know, still relevant. Things like PIC, the 8051, and Z80. Uh, it'd be possible to open LLVM up to these small, like, tiny microarchitectures that are common in embedded systems. Uh, so, you know, given the set of constraints, um, wait, this. Oh, right, uh, <laughs> skip the slide. Uh, so in particular, some of the things that make this chip really difficult to develop for, uh, and canonically it makes it hard to write C for, uh, it only has 256 bytes of stack. So the normal way of using a C stack, of putting local variables uh, relative to a stack pointer, uh, you can't do that using the hardware stack pointer. Uh, it only has three registers, they're only eight bits wide, and you can't dereference a pointer uh, using them. Uh, if you want to dereference a pointer, you have to put it in memory, in the first 256 bytes of memory, which is special, has special addressing modes, and you need to manage exceedingly carefully, like way more carefully than uh, memory is typically managed on most compiler targets. Uh, so given those constraints, um, we were able to make a pretty good end-to-end -end solution for this target. Uh, we have a C and C++ front end, uh, uh, someone made a Rust port, which is remarkable. Uh, and on average, we generate what I would call sort of okay code from the point of view of an uh, assembly language writer. Um, that is actually considerably better than the current state of the art, not even the reference compiler, which were maybe two to three times better than. But uh, what's interesting is we've seen this thing generate really, really good code. Uh, it just doesn't appear to do so consistently. And when we look into why, go in case by case in the cases where it's uh, generating suboptimal code, it appears to be more an issue of polish. Uh, various code generator passes in LLVM will expect the instructions that it sees to look a certain way or have certain properties. And if those are violated, then often early returns happen and like entire scopes of optimizations just you know don't happen. So, one of the things that we've had to do is go through and like regularize things and you know make sure everything looks normal, uh, which is very difficult because the chip is absolutely not normal. Uh, that being said, while we're polishing it, you can use it to make real projects, even ones with a degree of performance sensitivity. So here's a demo that someone put uh, together for the Atari 800. Um, so notable about this, uh, you know, it's it's not a super complicated demo, but it does have like effects that have to happen in the interval between video uh, vertical blanking on an NTSC or PAL video signal. So very relatively tight tolerances in manipulating hardware registers, uh, which is surprising considering that the entire main loop of that was 511 lines of really really high level Rust. Uh, so that was able to go all the way through uh, LVM. And there was music playing, but I didn't want to try to like deal with the, the sound system here. Uh, but yeah, all things together to get a sense of scale, that gets compiled down to maybe a 30 kilobyte executable uh, in the native format for the Atari 800. 
Uh, so to do that, to get reasonably good code out of LLVM for this tiny target, we had to do a bunch of weird stuff. I can't talk about like even a third of this because it's you know a 10 minute talk. Uh, the general theme is regularization. We took this processor and tried to make it look as normal as we possibly could. Uh, so in, in any way that we could possibly lie to LLVM, uh, we did uh, to make it look like it was uh, sort of risky, like x86 at the weirdest. Uh, and largely, if you can do that, as so long as you're willing to later go through and remove all of the lies and lower things to the way that they actually are. And often you can do that in constant overhead, so you don't actually lose anything by doing so. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions, though, and those are the more interesting ones and the ones that generalize outside of the target. So I wanted to tackle them uh, specifically, how we handled the stack and how we handled the limited number of registers. With regards to the stack, uh, like I mentioned, you can't put locals on it, it's too small. So typically what you do is maintain one in software, uh, which you bump manually by doing arithmetic. Uh, you can do that, but it's really, really slow. This is the canonical reason why you can't write a good C compiler for this chip. Uh, but assembly language programmers just don't deal with this at all. Uh, they just look at their call graph in its entirety and reason, well, I only wrote this section over here to be recursive, so why don't I just allocate everything else in like global memory? And then I'll set up a stack pointer only for the recursive region of the program. Uh, so we do that analysis, exactly. We uh, go and walk the call graph uh, in a conservative fashion for each translation unit, find uh, regions that we can prove don't recurse, and then allocate their memory statically. Uh, which is admittedly only half the story. There's two reasons to use a stack pointer. One is recursion, the other is asynchronicity and reentrancy. Uh, if we were to be conservative with regards to interrupt handling and asynchronicity, we'd have to assume that unbeknownst to the compiler, uh, an interrupt handler could call main, which would make everything possibly need to use a stack pointer and globally disable the optimization, which is incidentally how C usually models things. It tries not to do detailed reasoning about uh, the call graph in this fashion. Uh, but since we consider our, our translation unit to be the whole program, we default with link time optimization on and ship all of our SDK as bit code. Uh, if you have that model and are willing to annotate, say, where interrupts or asynchronous entry points happen, then you can also uh, find the things that are possibly callable for them and make those regions use dynamic stacks too. Uh, so with this regime of minor annotation, uh, we were able to get a pretty good solution to allow most code that we've seen for the 6502 to operate in a pretty much stack-free fashion, which matches uh, what we've seen for assembly language code that's been written for the platform. Uh, so that's the stack. Uh, the register set, uh, LLVM really doesn't like having only three registers. Um, the greedy register allocator largely does not seem to have been built to operate in that constraint of an environment, which makes sense. There's not really many real targets that only have three registers. Uh, but depending on who you talk to, the 6502 didn't either. In fact, it'd be difficult to imagine programming on something where there are only three places to put values. Uh, this, uh, processors from this era typically would call themselves something like a memory register architecture. Uh, and the zero page, this first 256 bytes of RAM, is kind of blessed in this fashion. It has a lot of uh, the properties that you would describe to registers. It's homogenous, there are special addressing modes to deal with them. So it's kind of tradition on this chip to treat these locations as if they were registers, and we take this quite literally. Uh, we reserve 32 bytes of them and present them to the entirety of the code generator as if they were architectural registers. Uh, and we maintain this illusion until very, very late in code generation, like near the time when assembly is being uh, assembled. Uh, at that point, they can be lowered to symbols and like, actually placed somewhere by the linker. Uh, and this allows us to have a really normal calling convention. We basically just ripped off RISC-V and we're able to have values flow in and out of uh, functions more or less like you'd expect. And we were able to take advantage of everything that LLVM offers for, for doing so. Uh, so all, putting that all together, um, I, we made a reasonably good target for this platform uh, and it's getting continuously better. Um, we'd like to upstream it eventually, but there's a couple big elephants in the room. Um, we have a really big diff from upstream. Outside of our target, it's like 20,000 lines, but mostly it's just test divergence, little tweaks here and there to upstream code gen passes. Uh, we need to decrease that diff and get the project down to its core. Uh, in the long term, we'd like to finish the experiment and get to actual human level performance and evaluate the cost and value of moving LLVM in that direction. Um, but I've, you know, I've left out a huge amount of information. The, uh, we have tons of documentation. You can also contact us. And, uh, and if you have any questions, I'm an open book. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>